expert in the field of biomedical engineering, Dr. Spinetta Golimati, associate professor at the Medical School of the National and Capital District University of Athens in Greece. Dr. Golimati holds a diploma in mechanical engineering from the National Technical University of Athens, as well as MSc and PhD degree in bioengineering from Imperial College London in United Kingdom. Her primary research interests lie in image analysis of B-mode ultrasound images, the carotid artery, and the identification of indices related to arterial mechanics and pathophysiology of the dermatitis plaque. Dr. Golimati, contribution extend beyond research. She is associate editor for Elsevier's Journal Ultrasonics and serves on the editorial boards of ERJ Open Research and BMC Cardiovascular Disorders. Her visit today was made possible through the efforts of the IEEE EMBS Study Chapter at Simulstat and by EMBS Distinguished Lecture Program. We are honored to have her as our distinguished IEEE lecturer. Please join me in welcoming. Dr. Espirata Valmati, as she shared her invaluable insights with us today. Well, good morning. Uh... It's very nice to be here. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Thank you to the organizers for the invitation. I'm very happy to be today here with you. I um, always find it very pleasing to visit new places and more importantly, to meet the new people. Yes. And um, I'm also very grateful to the Distinguished Lecturers Program of the Engineering in Medicine and Biology Society of the IEEE which actually uh, made it easier for this visit to happen. <laughs> now, so the topic of my presentation is exploring cardiovascular mechanics using ultrasound. And as you heard previously mm -hmm. uh, during this very kind introduction, uh, so this, this is actually very representative of uh, my field of research. I'm working with analysis of ultrasound images of the carotid artery. And I'm applying mathematical methods to analyze these images and extract the information from them. And uh, the study of the mechanics of the vascular system of the, of the carotid artery is actually a large part of my work. And to be honest, I'm going to be speaking a lot about the carotid artery today rather than other, um, other parts of the cardiovascular system. So as you can see, I'm... Uh, I'm, I'm uh, professor in the national in the medical school of the National Capodistrian University of Athens in Greece. But I have to say that uh, on top of my work as a professor in the university, I have been volunteering a lot for uh, IGBE. So I was the chair of the EMB Greece section for two terms, that is for four years. So I can only debate how this society is, uh, is volunteering uh, staff works. And also, I was the technical program chair for the IEEE International Symposium on Biomedical Imaging, which we organized this year, earlier this year in Greece. Uh, so, um, as I'm coming from far away, maybe I'm not sure you have ever been <laughs> in Greece, but I feel tempted to tell you a few words about my university. So, the National and Abolition University of Athens, was founded in 1837. Ah, sorry, did, did I do that? Sorry. No, no, no. Yes. Okay. So, okay, thank you. So the university was founded in 1837, which makes it a little bit younger than 200 years. And it took its name after Ioannis Kapodistrios, who was the first governor of Greece. Uh, now it has um, 42 different departments, which are organized in nine different schools. And recently there has been, in the last few years, there has been some extroversion activity. So there's a medical degree, that's an English medical degree that's offered to non-Greek citizens. And also our university is part of cities 
which is a European alliance with universities. Okay. Uh, so back to the presentation. So the cardiovascular system, as you, I assume you know very well, um, is one of the very important systems in our body because um, it actually makes sure that the blood and nutrients get all the tissues and organs, and also that waste is removed from the organs so as to go to the lungs and get cleaner and go back. So there's like this a closed circulation, and the major organs that make up this system are the heart. Then there are the vessels like the arteries, the veins, and the capillaries, and of course there's the blood itself. Now for the vessels there are Three, as you can see, there are three different types of vessels. There are the arteries and different sizes of arteries. They take blood from the heart to the organs. Sorry. So there are different sizes of arteries. And then, as you can see, the arteries have a, a structure of their own. So they have different layers. They have muscle inside them. They, they have elastin, they have collagen. You can find similar structure in the, in the, in the veins. However, these are their, 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 their wall is thinner. And then there's the capillaries, the very small, the smallest of the vessels, where there is this change between arteries and veins takes place. Okay, so what is important in terms of mechanics in the cardiovascular movement is that, it, that the cardiovascular system is in a constant movement. It is constantly moving because of the movement of the heart. You know the heart contracts and expands for systole and diastole, so as to expel blood towards uh, the vessels and the tissues. And because of this pulsating movement of the heart, everything else moves. So the blood moves like a wave. It comes and goes in, uh, in the cardiovascular system. Uh, but there's also the tissue, the tissue like the myocardium, the tissue of the heart, the muscle of the heart, but also the arterial wall. This is also, these structures are also in constant movement because of the movement of the heart. And then where's their movement? There's mechanics. And when we say mechanics, we mean a set, like a group, of indices that characterize the mechanical function of a system. So in mechanics, you are very familiar with terms like pressures, like forces, like velocities, displacement, strains, stresses, stiffness. And actually it's these same principles and these same indices that you can find in the cardiovascular system. So in the cardiovascular system, there's the pressure of the blood, the arterial blood. So you have the blood pressure, and then you have the changes of the pressure between systole and diastole. So for example, you have heard of systolic and diastolic pressures. There's also the velocity of the blood flow. And these parameters, like the pressures and blood flow velocity, they are widely and very commonly used in clinical diagnosis for cardiovascular disease. For example, you know that when a person has a very high blood pressure, they have hypertension, which is an abnormal, uh, an abnormal heart condition. Or when the, the, the flow velocity at a, certain, uh, at a certain area of the arterial or an artery is very high, this means there's a stenosis, there's a lesion over there, which also indicates the problem. Now, of course, there are also the displacements of the tissue, the movement of the tissue, the strains, the stresses that are exerted on the tissue, and then there is this concept of stiffness, of course, which is uh, actually a very important mechanical concept, stiffness, which indicates how soft or how hard a material is, and this can be extended in the cardiovascular system and in uh, the cardiovascular tissue. So, we, we can measure, one can measure how hard or how soft uh, is, for example, the myocardium or how hard or soft is the arterial wall. 
Now, what is interesting is that while, for example, blood pressure and blood flow velocity are widely used in clinical diagnosis, tissue stiffness and tissue strains and tissue displacements, they are not part of clinical, let's say, guidelines of clinical decision making. Why there is a wide, a wide uh, body of evidence in the literature in the last quite a few years that has indicated that these parameters actually are associated with cardiovascular risk, but for some reason they're still in this research uh, area. Now, another characteristic of uh, the mechanics in the cardiovascular system is that, um, is that uh, these indices have both a temporal and a spatial variability. So because, um, because the heart moves in a periodic way between systole and diastole, you can see this periodic pattern in practically all uh, mechanical indices that one can measure in the cardiovascular system. So you can see this periodicity uh, with time. And there's also spatial variability. Spatial variability means that these, that these features are different depending on the site of the cardiovascular system where they are measured. So for example, if you measure the blood pressure at the heart, it will be different than the blood pressure, for example, at the peripheral vessel. Or um, there will be differences between the pressures in the arteries and the pressures in the veins. So there is some spatial variability in any uh, mechanical index that one can measure throughout the cardiovascular system. And these are characteristics of how the mechanics work in this case. Now, why is it important to study cardiovascular mechanics? Cardiovascular mechanics is important to study because they provide us very useful information about, first and importantly, about the function of the cardiovascular system in normal conditions. And this is important to know. Uh, we may not need it in like everyday life to know how the cardiovascular system works, but it is important to know how our cardiovascular system works in normal conditions because this can be used as a baseline when we want to go and see how it works when the conditions are not uh, normal. Um, and also, it's important for a second reason because these mechanical properties actually change when uh, there's a problem. Uh, or when there's a change that is not under the category of problem. So, for example, mechanical properties change with ASG, which is a natural process, of course. And it has been shown that, for example, the, the, the tissue in the cardiovascular system becomes harder with age, which is normal. The, the, the mechanical properties also change when an intervention takes place one or the other way. For example, when someone starts or stops to exercise or when someone uh, changes their diets or when someone starts or stops smoking or when someone starts or stops taking medication. There's also a change in the mechanical properties. And of course, uh, mechanical properties change when there is some disease. And of course, this goes for cardiovascular disease, work, like for example, hypertension, or um, I don't know, other amounts of blood, they change the mechanical properties of the cardiovascular system. But what is also interesting to note is that um, the properties, the mechanical properties of the cardiovascular system may change, it has been shown that they may change when there is other types of diseases, for example, when there is uh, respiratory disease like uh, obstructive sleep apnea, it has been shown that this affects uh, cardiovascular properties. It has also been shown that cardiovascular properties change when there is, for example, periodontal disease or um, uh, neurological disease. It has been shown that mechanical properties of arteries, and in particular the carotid artery, are affected when there is cognitive decline, when there's a problem in the neurological system. So there are actually quite a few reasons why it is important to study um, cardiovascular mechanics. Now, also sound imaging, uh, cardiovascular mechanics can be measured with a few methods. Ultrasound imaging is an imaging modality which um, 
is widely used in clinical diagnosis for cardiovascular disease. And it's also very useful when one would like to study um, cardiovascular, uh, sorry, I wanted to see if, if this video on the right hand side can play. I'm not sure how to do that. Uh, if you can just click on that. So um, these are two um, two uh, representative modalities in ultrasound imaging. No, that was the previous one. No. no. I don't know how this video might work. No. It's not no. working. Video. No. Okay. Okay. I don't know why. So anyway, um, so ultrasound imaging, these are two typical modalities in ultrasound images. For example, in Doppler, using Doppler, you can see the velocity, you can see the lower part of that image, you can see the velocity of, that, of, of the blood flow, which is extensively used in the diagnosis of arterial disease. And on the right hand side, you can see uh, a B mode image. This is like a more characteristic image in B mode uh, in, in ultrasound imaging. And and well, we, we play this video, you would see the arterial wall moving. Uh, so once you can see the arterial wall moving, then you can actually measure how this uh, is moving. So apart from um, from this uh, ability of ultrasound imaging to provide a uh, real time imaging of uh, motion, either the blood or the tissue motion, there are of course quite a few. Uh, merits in this type of imaging that make it very useful when it comes to uh, to studying the cardiovascular system. So one is that ultrasound imaging uses non-ionizing radiation, so it's uh, not invasive. It has a very small size, so it can be available at the bedside. And actually, uh, now with uh, its size going from smaller to smaller, it can be used practically anywhere. You can have an ultrasound on your on your phone, for example, then attach a probe and you can do ultrasound even at home. Uh, while there have been some wearable devices for ultrasound, so you can just wear uh, an ultrasound sensor and go walking anywhere and have your, uh, your images uh, being taken. And also it's low cost, it's the lowest cost modality that exists at the moment, which makes its use be widespread. It can be used in environments that are low, low in resources. So when there are, when the cost is a concern, uh, ultrasound imaging can be used and can actually provide a lot of information about the underlying problems. Now, just for reasons of completeness, how, how ultrasound is, uh, is working. So an ultrasound could actually have a transducer, and this transducer works uh, in both ways, as a transmitter and as a receiver. So it actually transmits ultrasound waves into the tissue, um, which makes uh, this type of modality well, sort of an active approach, because actually you have to send some sound and then hear the echo that comes back, uh, which is like knock on something and depending on on what you hear and one and when you hear it you, you realize what it is so if I, if I knock here and if I knock here I hear different types of noises different types of sounds so this is how uh, you can differentiate but also from from the time it takes for the echo to come back you can understand how far or how close to you is uh, the structure you are, you are trying to image. So then there are there are two uh, main types of interaction of sound with biological tissue. So one is reflection. So when actually sound hits um, an area where its characteristic dimension is larger than its wavelength, a part of it reflects back to the transducer, while the remaining continues its journey into the uh, tissue. And the other major type of interaction is uh, scatter. So when uh, there are small particles with characteristic dimensions lower than the wavelength of the ultrasound, then the sound is scattered in all different directions, and this is responsible for the characteristic uh, appearances of the big bone images of the ultrasound that you have seen, I'm sure. 
Um, okay, these are three uh, typical ultrasound modalities among a number of ultrasound modalities that are available, which are used to study different aspects of mechanical phenomena in the cardiovascular system. So, for example, B mode can be used to assess tissue motion, elastography can be used to assess strains and stiffness of the tissue, and the Doppler uh, can be used to assess blood flow velocities. Uh, now, in B-mode ultrasound imaging, where B there stands for uh, brightness, um, the physical principle relies on the fact that this image represents a map of echoes after uh, they have interacted with the tissues uh, through which um, uh, they have gone. And with this modality, we can study motion and mechanical properties of the cardiovascular system on top of other properties. For example, we can also measure dimensions uh, as we can do with any imaging modality because the major property in tissue that one can assess with imaging is of course tissue dimensions. And also we can, uh, we can assess morphology, that is how the tissue, whether it's dark, whether it's bright, how are bright and dark areas uh, allocated related to each other. Now, these are three characteristic videos of three different uh, cases. These are um, B-mode images of the carotid artery. I'm really sorry, I cannot play this. But even so, I mean, even um, what you can see, uh, you, can, you can have a real-time image of the carotid artery, a real-time ultrasound image of the carotid artery. And then, um, well, an experienced radiologist might be able to say a few things. For example, they might be able to say that, okay, this, this artery that is uh, in a male subject, in an elderly male subject, moves less than, for example, the artery of a younger subject. And this, you can see. You can see, but you don't have a number. You don't know how, how much this is moving. Uh, when you see this video, this is, uh, this is a patient with an atheromatous plaque, which is a focal even of the arterial wall. Uh, and you can see there different patterns of, of motion. And actually, in all of these cases, apart from, from the fact that someone would see like the arterial wall, so it's like here in, in the anterior wall, here is the posterior wall, and during the cardiac cycle, you can see these, these two walls moving closer and away from each other. But apart from that, which has been studied in the literature a lot, there are other phenomena that are not easy to see for an unexperienced physician or uh, they are not easy to see even for an experienced radiologist, for example. There is some longitudinal movement, there is some movement of the arterial wall that way. And there is also longitudinal movement relative between adjacent layers in the arterial wall. And these are phenomena that have not been adequately explored so far. And this is what we are trying, we are actually trying to do. We are trying to shed some light to the complex mechanical phenomena that take place here that can be uh, can be assessed using ultrasound imaging, but we need some mathematical methods to be able to provide some quantitative indices of this phenomena. Now, I'm talking a lot about the carotid artery, so I have to explain what the carotid artery is. So the carotid artery is actually the artery that takes blood to the brain. We have two carotid arteries, each one of us, one on the left and one on the right side. Um, of, the, of the neck, and each, each carotid artery starts as a common branch, and then it is divided into an internal uh, branch, the internal carotid artery, which takes blood to the brain, and an external carotid artery, which takes blood to the organs. So when there's a problem with the carotid artery, what, what happens is a person can develop, uh, can, can have a stroke or a transient ischemic attack, or even they might have, like, a uh, uh, they have some, uh, some temporary blindness in the external branch that goes to the eyes. Now, like, like all arteries, the carotid artery has different head. It's composed of three different layers. They are called the intima, the media, and the adventitia. The intima is the inner one, the one that is in contact with the blood. Then there's uh, 
a thin uh, layer that's called the media, and then there's the adventitia, which is the external one, and that is in contact with the adjacent tissue. The major constitutes of the carotid artery, like of course, all antics are elastin and collagen. And this, and it's important because the relative percentage of these constitutes change with age, but also with the presence of disease. So when we're young, there's a lot of elastin, so there's a lot of elasticity, and you can and we can see the arterial wall moving a lot. But as we get older, collagen takes over, there's more collagen. This is harder as a material which means that our arteries become harder as we grow older, and this procedure might be more accelerated if there's some problem, for example, if there's hypertension, if there's diabetes or any other disease, this is more, this goes faster. Now, the motion, this motion of the artery, um, as I said before, it is due to the oscillations of uh, of the blood pressure during the cardiac cycle, yeah, but this arterial wall moves actually in all directions, the radial, the longitudinal, and the circumferential. Uh, there are different characteristics in this motion, for example, that this motion is periodic, of course, because it follows the movement of the heart. There is a, a relative motion between adjacent layers, which we call shear, uh, and there's also movement because there's also limitations in this movement because the arterial wall is tethered, is connected to the surrounding tissue. So you can see there are a lot of phenomena overlapping that uh, make up of how this uh, the arterial wall moves. Now, when we have an image of, uh, for example, an ultrasound image of the carotid artery, and of course what I'm saying here about the carotid artery can easily be extended to other uh, cardiovascular tissues. The carotid artery is, well, I should have said that before, the carotid artery is important for many reasons. One is it is very, it's a very superficial organ, so it is very easily accessible. It's, it's very easy to do. Uh, so, I mean, even a, a, a less experienced radiologist can very easily have a good ultrasound of the carotid artery. But what's also important is that the carotid artery has been shown to be a window to the cardiovascular system. So once you look at the properties of the carotid artery, you can have some idea about the rest of the cardiovascular system. And this, of course, has been shown in the literature. So once you have an image like that, an ultrasound image of the carotid artery, so this is the posterior wall, this is the anterior wall, then on that image, you actually, this is a two-dimensional image, and you can see this in two directions. We call these directions the radial direction because it's along the radius of the vessel and the longitudinal direction, which is perpendicular to the first one, and it's actually along the axis of the vessel. Now, if you have this, um, a magnification of this very small area, you might be able to see by the different, uh, by the different colors, by the different grayscales, you can see the three different layers uh, of the artery. So you can have a lot of detail about what happens uh, in this uh, in this place. Now, of course, to assess motion, you need uh, an algorithm, you need a, a mathematical method. Um, so we've, we have been working a lot with what is called cross-correlation. So you can actually select a region of interest on your image. And then you scan an area around that image to, so as to find on another image. Okay, so you can find a region of interest that closely matches the appearance of the one you selected on your first image. So you have an image here, which is the reference image, and then you have all the other images in the sequence where you try to find the region of interest that close is closely related in terms of its appearance to the one you selected on the reference image. Um, now, we actually experimented at that point, we experimented a lot with different uh, motion estimators, with different algorithms for estimating uh, motion from uh, ultrasound images. And what, well, we used synthetic data to, the, to do that. So we had some real images, uh, and then we 
constructed, we made some mathematical uh, models of the motion in the radial and longitudinal directions, the two uh, typical directions in the two dimensional image from, uh, from the literature. And we displaced these uh, images with these models. So this was our way to, uh, to test the different algorithms. We used um, a framework, actually an in silico framework. So we used uh, many, uh, many different images. You can see here images from normal, uh, from normal subjects, from subjects with lesions. We corrupted these images with different levels of noise. So we had like a large framework of, I don't know, about 13 or 15 different um, different data on which we tested our, our different algorithms. And in, uh, in one of our earlier works, these are the algorithms that um, we ended up um, um, observing that they were the best and the most uh, uh, and the most accurate in detecting uh, motion in ultrasound images. So using uh, these algorithms, then we started playing around with the images and what we could uh, and what we could uh, study, what what we could assess. So the first thing uh, we did, and that was like uh, as a as a baseline measurement, was something that of course has been studied a lot in the literature. So we studied the radial motion of two characteristic regions on the anterior and the posterior walls. So you can see here there is a very nice periodic waveform of the anterior wall, okay, and a nice periodic waveform of the posterior wall. Now, if you simply subtract those two, you can have this change of the diameter, uh, of the diameter of the anterior wall. And you can see how this diameter changes between systole and diastole. This is very nice. This looks very nice. It, it follows the, the, uh, the, uh, the function of the heart. And of course, from this, uh, this, this, of course, has been studied a lot in the literature. And from this, if, for example, you do the same thing uh, for an elderly subject, then you can very easily see, with, uh, I mean, at, at first, and I think that's very interesting, you can see how the, uh, the diameter of an elderly subject, who, of course, is expected to have a stiffer artery, it actually moves, it has a lower amplitude in the movement. You see here, with respect to here, which is, you can see, of course, an indication uh, using this, uh, this method. You, you can have the first indication of how uh, a stiffer artery in an elderly subject behaves. But of course, as I said, this has been studied a lot in the literature, but it's, of course, good to know that you agree what has been said so far by other scientists. What has not been explored that much is that if you look inside inside the arterial wall. And you do the same for two uh, areas, but this time not for, uh, for the diameter, but for two, for two areas inside the arterial wall, then you can see a similar thing. So the actual arterial wall is compressed with systole as, as the arterial wall expands with systole, the, the wall is actually compressed. And you can actually see this change, how this change actually follows the observation that we made for the diameters in the young and the elderly subject. And this is actually a phenomenon that I haven't really seen very much in the literature so far about it. Now, another interesting phenomenon that can uh, be derived from this type of analysis is to study the motion of the arterial wall in the longitudinal direction. And this is a phenomenon that has relatively recently gained attention. And our group, you can see here, we have a publication in 2003, which was 21 years ago. And that actually coincides with the first time I came to Mexico. <laughs> I don't know if this is just a probably. Uh, this is the work I did in my, in my PhD. Uh, but, but actually, this phenomenon of how the arterial move how the arterial wall moves in the longitudinal direction has not yet gained as much attention. But it was interesting to see 
that when you get uh, the longitudinal displacement of the arterial wall, you have a periodic waveform. It follows the periodicity in the radial direction, which is systole and diastole. And it is also important that it has like this characteristic, uh, let's say, double face uh, appearance, but not, not, not always. Well, that's another example of how this longitudinal motion can be measured. So you can see here the different layers of the arterial wall. You can see the carotid artery here. This is the region we are, we are interested in. And you can see here a representative waveform in the longitudinal, in the motion in the longitudinal dimension with anterograde and retrograde motion. And you can see also here how this um, this actually it follows the periodicity of the ECG or how uh, the, of the, of the work of the heart. And from this longitudinal, uh, from this longitudinal direction, another uh, phenomenon that one can study is the, the so-called shear strain. Shear strain is actually how adjacent layers slide with one with uh, respect one to the other. So the shear strain in mechanics, it results from the application of opposing forces in a direction parallel to the surface. And it, it is about the relative longitudinal displacement of adjacent wall layers. So you can see here uh, what the shear stress is about. And it, it, and it is usually expressed in terms of this angle, uh, this angle gamma. Uh, which is uh, an index of uh, the amount of the shear strength. I think, and, well, in, again, uh, within the arterial wall of the carotid artery, you can see here this is the adventitia, this is the intima, and these are the two regions of interest one in the intima, one in the adventitia, and these are um, their uh, locations at a different type time in the cardiac cycle. And this is the formula that is used to calculate uh, the shear strain, uh, the shear strain angle. So yeah, with, which is with respect to their longitudinal uh, displacements and normalized by their distance uh, in the vertical direction. And these are some examples of uh, longitudinal displacements of these two areas. This is the shear strain, an example of the shear strain. So you can see again that the shear strain follows a periodic pattern. So again, uh, the arterial wall, the layers of the arterial wall slide with respect to each other and actually following the periodicity of the heart cycle. And this is a representative uh, waveform of one of these cycles. So that you can see what this looks like, and from which we can make measurements about, for example, the maximum shear strain or the past shear strain here. Okay, that's another example of the shear displacement here with the solid line, and how this follows the, uh, the dotted line is the diameter of the vessel, and you can see how this shear strain follows actually uh, the diameter of the vessel. Um, an important uh, finding when studying uh, shear strains that uh, was by a group in Sweden who is working a lot with uh, longitudinal displacements and shear strains. So they found, and uh, I thought this was quite interesting, that when, for example, uh, there is these catecholamines that are administered to a patient, catecholamines are, are uh, drugs that uh, are, uh, are, are uh, administered to patients who are in the intensive care units, so patients, for example, with very, very low uh, blood pressure, so, so they give them that, it's, it's like adrenaline, actually, it's adrenaline, catecholamine, it's adrenaline, they give them this adrenaline so as to make them, to make their cardiovascular system be more, let's say, alive. And they found out that, that when catecholamines are administered, there is a large, there is a huge, like 400% change in the longitudinal, uh, in, the, in the motion of the artery in the longitudinal direction. So that's another uh, quite unexplored phenomenon about how this longitudinal movement might move uh, when medication is administered. Uh, this is an example of uh, studying the motion of the arterial wall when there's, there's a lesion, where there's a problem, there's an afferomatous blood over there. And here you can see, you can see, for example, this is um, 
the diameter, this is actually the strain of the wall adjacent to the lesion. And this dotted line here shows actually how, uh, how there's the relative motion in the flag. And what, what this actually tells you is that when, for example, the arterial wall expands, then the plaque actually um, compresses. And this shows that the phenomena in the arterial wall, they're quite complex. It's everything is not moving together. There are, rel there are relative motions, and actually it has been found that where there are a lot of relative motions, it's where it's more, um, it's more possible to have a cardiovascular event, either in an infarction or a stroke. So this is another, um, another estimate of how this uh, moves in an inhomogeneous way. And here you can see um, an example of the shear strain again of the arterial wall with its characteristic periodic pattern in relation uh, to the movement of the diameter of the heartbeat. Uh, another um, thing that, that we did, we actually measured um, movements like the, the motion of the radial, uh, the amplitude of the radial motion and the amplitude of the longitudinal motion along the boundaries of uh, the atheromatous plaque with the wall. Uh, what what, did we, what when can we see with that? With that, we can see that where there is, there is more um, there is more increased difference in the color. That means there are more relative movements. There is more inhomogeneity in the movement. And what we saw is that, for example, in this case, which is a high-risk case, there was more uh, dissimilarity in the colors, more inhomogeneous motion compared to the low-risk case where there is more homogeneity in the motion. So that means a more homogeneous motion along the tissue where there is homogeneous motion, everything moves together, the risk of having an adverse event is low. Where there is inhomogeneity, things move differently from one another, then it's more possible to have an event like, for example, stroke. Okay, then in this, again, these were some videos, but you, you can see, so you, you could see these different areas moving. Then we tried to, uh, to assess this inhomogeneity in the motion. And to do this, we tried to quantify this asynchrony in the motion in the arterial wall. Uh, and to do this, we, um, well, we measured, so you can see here, uh, so we measured uh, waveforms of movement of adjacent points, and you can see that there are some lower or larger phase differences if you see, if you look at points adjacent to each other. And similarly to the previous, uh, to the previous uh, images, you can see here that in this case, there's a lot of homogeneity. Everything is red, it's the same color, and this is a moderate stenosis this is a low risk, a low, low risk case, no symptoms. While in this case, which is a case that had produced the symptom, uh, a stroke in that case, you can see there are alterate alternations between blue and red areas indicating higher inhomogeneity in terms of their phase differences. You can see that also here, for example. If you measure phase differences between these areas that are far away at the top, of, at the maximum, at the, the site of maximum stenosis, that are higher compared to, for example, when you look at areas at the downstream or the upstream of the plan of the lesion. Okay, another, another step we took, then we wanted to see whether we could um, actually uh, predict or, or why, why what, whether we could use indices of mechanical properties to predict um, cardiovascular uh, cardiovascular risk. So you may see in this list here, it's not very clear, but, but you can tell that that's, that's a very large list of uh, indices of uh, mechanical properties or to the market properties of cardiovascular function. And then we use this uh, in a system trying to predict uh, uh, cardiovascular risk, and we actually ended up with a tool 
that um, yielding about 88% performance. Now, another, um, another um, effort uh, that was in collaboration with Columbia University. So we, we use ultrasound imaging to assess the stiffness of the arterial wall in vivo. Uh, to do this, uh, we, um, we use images, ultrasound images, from which we estimate the motion. And we also used another uh, modality, another method, that was a planation tonometry to measure uh, pressures uh, on the arterial wall. Because, of course, when you want to measure stiffness, you need the strain, which is the displacement, of course, also the displacement, but you also need an estimate of the force or the stress. So from uh, images, we used images like that. From the images, we estimated diameters. We have seen diameters before. So of course, you can see here what is expected. So we have a slightly elderly subject at a lower amplitude in their diameters. Then we estimated with uh, atonometry. Uh, we estimated the pressure. Again, of the same artery. So on the same artery, we applied all the sound, and then we applied the, the tonometry. And then we put these two signals, which is uh, the, the strain from the diameter and the stress from uh, the pressure measurement, we put them on uh, the axis, on, stre on stress strain axis, uh, which are typical axes for measuring uh, mechanical properties of any material. And that was that's interesting to see. It's, I think quite innovative to see the uh, the stiffness of the arterial wall in vivo. So what can you see here? So for example, here you can see that there is um, a point, a transition point here, and to the left and to the side of this transition point, you have curves that can be. Um, uh, that can be approached, approximated, uh, linear, there's, there's a linear approximation with different, um, so they have different, these curves have different characteristics. And it's actually the, uh, the, the elastic modulus, uh, one and two, corresponding to the left and to the side, to the right side of the transition point. So you have the elastic modulus C1 and E2, and these were significantly uh, higher uh, in the elderly subjects, indicating that uh, stiffness is higher in uh, elderly subjects. Of course, we knew that already in, uh, in the bibliography. What is the new information here is that is that um, measuring uh, uh, the mechanical properties all the way to different uh, to different values of strains and different values of stresses is something that is new. So far, bibliography and literature is based on single values of pressures, like systolic and diastolic, and there is no information about how the mechanical properties change over the entire range of stresses and strains in the, uh, in the cardiac cycle. Uh, another interesting uh, phenomenon here was this transition point between E1 and E2 uh, was lower, you can see it's, it's to the left, the elderly subject. And this actually, we think, presumption, we think that this is also an index of, um, uh, of stiffness, which also is not known in the data we have so far. Why? Because this signifies the time, this transition point signifies, we presume that this signifies the time when um, uh, elasticity stops working and it's the start of the collagen, which is, which is sniffer. So the older you get, uh, this, um, the collagen comes into play earlier than elastin, and this is an indication again of stiffness. So uh, having the stress strain relationship all the way, all values of stress and stress is something, also the stiffness of the arterial wall is, of course, seen assessed uh, so far as well. 
Um, okay, let me tell you a few things about other the other uh, two modalities. Just a few things uh, before I finish. Yeah. Uh, so uh, elastography, as the name implies, is about an imaging is imaging the elastic properties of uh, the tissue. And this can be done in two ways. There are two types of elastography. One is uh, strain elastography, and the other one is uh, shear strain elastography, uh, shear wave elastography. So in strain elastography, it's the tissue deformation that we are assessing. The percent the tissue has been deformed during the cardiac cycle. Uh, in the second type of the, the, the shear wave elastography, it's actually, it's not strain, but it's actually the, uh, the stiffness. It's how hard or how stiff uh, the tissue is. Uh, so if one is the strain, the other one is the shear wave speed, which is measured in Pascal, which is uh, a unit of stiffness. Uh, so elastography, the way elastography works is actually you take two images, or ultrasound images, corresponding to, for example, two different time points in the cardiac cycle. Then there is processing of these uh, images and then for example, like we can uh, subtract one from the other, and where this subtraction ends up in a large value, this means there's a lot of deformation, there's a lot of change, so you can see a high value uh, of strain, this is where elasticity is, where there is the, the difference is small, the, uh, the tissue has not changed between uh, the two images, so you cannot see uh, any elasticity there. Okay, and these are some examples of elastography, uh, again, in the carot the ferromatous plaque, and you can see again here, uh, you, you have a lot of strain uh, in, in the vulnerable, in the high-risk plaque, you have a lot of uh, ovinomogenities, a lot of differences in the tissue, you have a more homogeneous case, a more, more homogeneous image uh, where there is low risk. Uh, and this is how shear wave elastography uh, works. So in shear wave elastography, you actually have a shear wave. Uh, that's when you can see the shear wave, how this expands from, for different time points. So this expands towards the uh, inside the tissue, and then um, it's acquired by ultrafast uh, ultrasound imaging. So you need to have some ultrafast imaging uh, over there. And this is an example. Again, you can see how this shows you the stiffness, um, uh, the stiffness of uh, the arterial wall in terms of Pascal's over here. And finally, a few things about Doppler. Doppler, I think you know, you know Doppler very well, you know from physics. So Doppler is a phenomenon that indicates change of frequency when a target moves in relation to the source. And this widely used, Doppler is widely used uh, to measure the velocity of that blood flow and widely used in clinical practice to assess the degree of stenosis, how serious uh, an, arterial, uh, an arterial disease is. But what is important in Doppler is that recently there has been this vector flow imaging, which is an extension of the conventional Doppler. And this allows to have velocities not only in one direction, that was the direction of probe, but now you can have vector velocity imaging, so you can have uh, like a spatial distribution of blood flow velocities inside uh, the vessels. And it's interesting that this has been shown to the, the, the values of the, of the blood flow velocities in this case have been shown to be comparable those obtained from magnetic resonance angiography. Uh, so, well, in conclusion, I hope that I have shown you that there is room for assessment of so far uh, unexplored complex uh, mechanical phenomena uh, in the cardiovascular system. And this is feasible to do with ultrasound imaging and uh, it is amenable to new knowledge, to valuable new knowledge about cardiovascular physiology and pathophysiology, and this also is an indication of the usefulness and, um, and, the, and the value of ultrasound imaging, which, uh, which is able to provide not only anatomical information, but also functional information, which is uh, the most important mechanical properties. And of course, all this remains to be 
uh, remains um, remains in the research and remains to be proved in clinical practice using uh, larger, of course, data sets. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, attention. Thank you to the IPB Distinguished Lecture Pro uh, Program for this exciting opportunity. And I, I do hope to see you or any of you uh, sometime in Greece. <laughs>
use this uh, yeah this, yeah uh, tool. Yeah, yeah, just this tool. Well, um, we we have tried using deep learning um, in, in two in two areas. One was to differentiate between high risk and low risk in terms of prediction between high risk and low risk uh, indices of high risk and low risk cases for prediction. Uh, it didn't work. And one reason it didn't work is because we don't have that many uh, data. Because deep learning, you need to have a lot of data to, to work. If you don't have a lot of data, deep learning is not good for you. You have to go to, to, to use other machine learning methods. So this is where we are in this respect. But we have also made some preliminary work, but very preliminary. This has not progressed very much. We are trying to, to use convolutional neural networks to uh, to produce uh, ultrasound images of non-actual subjects, so that we have a, a large, um, uh, let's say, a large series of different ultrasound images of different subjects, and then trying to do uh, synthetic data, um, making synthet synthetic data from this, which we could use for, for example, training algorithms, our algorithms, etc. So yes, the answer is yes. We we are. In the, con in, the, in the context of experimenting with uh, applications of convolutional and neural networks, yeah, but no, not there yet, not there yet, yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, again, thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you again to Toxada, to Nicola, Spirita Golimati, for coming to share your experience, your research. Thank you. This is some small recognition. Ah, thank you. Thank, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you to the, <laughs> to the <laughs> chapter. I understand. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Now it's time for the coffee breaks. Sorry by the communists. <laughs> I'm the one who will put it in the technical session. Thank you. Thank you.